The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Welcome to Garden Connections. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. Today we're talking with Audrey Alfson from the Houston Community Garden. They've really done a nice job bringing the community together around the production and distribution of fresh food. It's more than just neighbors gardening in a common space. We also visit the home of Barbara and Glenn, who were on the Rochester Garden and Flower Tour this year. They have a lovely mix of French country and formal English styles. And Chef Stephen Larson brings us a tasty appetizer, corn and crab hush puppies with jalapeno tartar sauce. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Garden Connections is next. Well, we're going to talk about community gardens today, and our special guest is Audrey Elson. Audrey, thanks for being part of the program. Thanks for having me. So give us a sense of what Houston is like as a community. It's a fairly small town in the hills, kind of towards bluff country. Describe your, your community for us. Um, Houston is uh, definitely right in bluff country, a small little town, less than a thousand people. Not too far from La Crosse, not too far from Winona, but just far enough to be its own very close-knit small community. All right, sounds great. Now you guys put together a community garden, but I'm interested in what you see as the definition of a community garden. So let's take a little bit broader picture first, and then we'll ask you for details about yours. Community gardens, which have really grown in popularity in the last five, ten years mm -hmm. across the nation, are typically gardens that create a space for people to have their own individual plots and the plot size will vary but it's a space that's set aside um, often by cities sometimes by community organizations that they find some piece of ground and they're able to till it up and then they divide those areas into plots that then individuals or family can garden mm -hmm. on their own they mm -hmm. can grow what they like right. um, and so that's kind of what community gardens are. The most common model, yeah. Most common model, and they're really they're really showing up, especially in urban areas, um, mm -hmm. in popularity that they're taking vacant lots and turning them into right. food places, which yeah, is which incredible. Is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So when you guys uh, started talking about a community garden, give us a sense of your history. How, how, who were the instigators and, and what was the conversation that was taking place? Well, uh, over seven years ago, um, I, I, and I have to go back and I'll be brief, but I, I'm a teacher by training and when I, I quit teaching about eight or nine years ago when my son started school, started kindergarten in Houston, uh, because I had been teaching in Wisconsin, it was easy for me to stay on one end and I have a young daughter I was at home with. So I became involved with the schools and went back and reinvented myself as a health coach. So I became very involved in food related issues mm -hmm. and I began working with community members. We were talking about the school food which grew into other conversations and in working with clients, um, I really saw a need for people to reconnect with just good food, real food. And mm -hmm. often an excuse was, um, it's too expensive, I can't buy this. I don't mm -hmm. know how to cook it. Um, I can't do this. And so it became this exasperation. Like, we need to figure out how to do this again because right. it's not that hard. Right. So I began talking with the, with the elementary school principal and we were sitting on the steps of the elementary school one spring and we said, can we do this? We need to have a way to connect people to food, to get kids connected to food again. Mm -hmm. Should we do this? And I said, yes. And we began talking and through several steps, worked with the city and found a piece of property, a piece of land, a city property that we were able to use. Mm -hmm which was all well and good, but we had no money. Um, and <laughs> just a plan, we way, had no money, <laughs> but we had just a plan that we need a community garden. Let's create right. something that was really educationally based, mm -hmm. which was really at its heart, was getting people to reconnect with food and learning how to grow food and learning how to cook okay. it and enjoying that yeah. good food again. And you guys have really done kind of a unique approach to your community mm -hmm. garden, which we are gonna talk about in just a little bit. And you're gonna give us some details about how you decided how to go about pulling this educational piece together. Okay. But right now we're gonna send you to Rochester, to the home of Barbara and Glenn. They have a beautiful garden, I know you'll enjoy it. Barbara, you had a lovely garden here. You have several things going on. There's so much to see here, but let's start with right here. You've got great things happening really on the lower level of the garden. It's, it's so mm -hmm. cute. It's, I've seen these in pots, yes. but I've never seen them incorporated yes. into a garden. Tell us what you've got going here it's in this fairy well, garden. Here. We have a little fairy community here, 
Community. And that's a, a community. community. Yes, it's a gardening fairy community, and they have great times when I'm not here because I come out the next morning. Summer tipped over, and who knows uh, what they've been somebody's doing. Somebody's moved. Yes, but this was just to utilize this space under the tree. I was trying to incorporate more of the um, shade that I'm finally starting to mm -hmm. foster over mm -hmm. here, and so then you can have the ferns and the astilbes and, and these types of plants that are more shade loving. Right, and, and very whimsical. I love humor in a garden. Right, right. So I had to do it on the ground. I don't have space for small things mm -hmm. just because of the complex here. So this works for my garden and it's, it's underneath adorable. a river birch tree. I love that tree. That bark is so unusual. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you called it a river birch? It's a river birch. Okay. And about how old is this tree? Uh, this tree is 10 years old. Okay. 10 years so old. So nice mm -hmm. size to it. Yeah. Great dappled shade in here. So you mentioned some ferns and what's this beautiful kind of chartreuse green? That's I love called that color. Creeping Jenny. Okay. And it will keep that color as long as it gets X amount of sunshine during the day. Okay. So this gets the benefit of the morning sun and then we get a little deeper shade of green because it gets the shade. Okay. And that's what gives it variety. It's variety. All right. Yeah. Well, let's keep looking okay. at it. And tell me more about what you have have here. Stephanie, many of the plants that we put in our garden have meaning for us mm -hmm. and in particular like the zinnias. I plant those in honor of my mother. She loves zinnias. Nice. As well as roses. She was oh, a sure. big yep. rose lover. Peonies. But these are all perennials and when we moved out here this was a blank canvas full of clay soil and uh, rock. Okay. We have dug up every state shaped rock that there <laughs> is. It's been here. So what did you do when you had all that clay? How did you manage that? Did you bring a lot of dirt in or? Um, basically, I started out phase one. It was hole by hole. I was amending the soil. Okay. But when we opened up phase three, which was on either side of this fence and then all the way around, we cut up all the sod ourselves, schlepped it to the compost center, and uh, then we brought in trailer loads just to amend all of this. And it was such a delight to be able to dig a hole in real dirt and with right. no rocks. <laughs> right, oh, what a change, what yeah. a change. And your plants clearly love it. They do, and that's a natural prairie. Um, we've incorporated some prairie plantings, mm -hmm. again, from our garden club. Um, a gentleman had us out at his home and he said, please take a plant. Oh. And when I brought that home, it was a spindle little thing and I really didn't know what it was. Uh, and so you it stuck was, it in the back. I and stuck then... it in the back and it was bright orange and you just need color variation because yep. everything's in bloom at different times. That's a great contrast to the white. Is that baby's mm -hmm. breath that you that have? That is baby's breath. I have breath. never seen that growing as a plant. Mm -hmm. Yep. And That's I beautiful. had them in front of the roses because they're very friendly with roses. Yeah. And mm -hmm. make them look beautiful besides. They do. All right. Yeah. Well, let's keep looking. Okay. So this arbor is a fantastic structure, feature of your garden. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about it. I, I love the story about this is something you actually helped to make. I did. This is the very first thing my husband and I did together as a couple. And we figured it was a good test because neither <laughs> one of us really knew beautiful. what we were doing other than research. Um, so yeah, we did this probably 14 years ago because okay. uh, there was no shade. We had no trees, mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. And so he learned what a pergola was and we incorporated wisteria so one side is a lavender okay. purple and the other one is a blue. It's a blue and probably in about three days they'll be it'll be in total bloom in total bloom it'll how be long do those blossoms usually last they will last a good week oh, yeah. right. my visions was to sit here with a mint julep and have them <laughs> draping down on me and i've achieved it so i'm happy all right very good and are these in the ground or yes. are they in pots do you move them or they no, stay out all they, winter these are northern hardy wow yeah. lots of great growth already mm -hmm. that's yeah. terrific yeah, and you use your gymnastic skills when you go up on top and you start weaving them through. So you through. do have to train them to come yes. through it. Mm -hmm. And okay. then they're on their own. And then they're on their own. Looks mm -hmm. fantastic. A lovely place to yep. sit. Yep. Barbara, you've done so many nice different styles and, and yet it all is so cohesive. I mean, it's the color mm -hmm. that pulls it together. I love that. Mm -hmm. But this just drew my attention right away when we came into into your backyard. And this is kind of an English piece. We, we saw the yes. French countryside with the picket fence and, mm -hmm. and the lion. The lion. Yep. Leo. <laughs> this is gorgeous. It's very formal. It's just bursting with color. Mm -hmm. Tell us how this came about yeah. and, and why you chose the plants that you did for this particular okay. space. Well, this was our little albatross because this is where our <laughs> septic look system like an is. At all. So we had to have something that was functional, mm -hmm. pleasing to the eye, but yet mobile. When we needed to access the drainage areas, mm -hmm. we could do it. So these are all annuals, easily okay. dug up. Mm -hmm. um, 
But interesting enough, all the alyssum on the outside, the white, mm -hmm. they will become their own plant. They will come back next year okay. in all kinds of different places. They reseed themselves. <laughs> they will reseed and in so you look place. in here and you'll see amongst the begonias there's some um, moss roses. Okay. You know, they're they're on their own. If they come back, more power to them. You let them stay. Yes. Is, is the symmetry, is that what, you know, when we talk about English gardens, yes. there are cottage styles, but this is really quite right. formal. Right. The boxwoods are what really define the fact that it's an English garden. The fountain, we call it our grandchild cherub for our grandchildren, because mm -hmm. they love to come out here and mess around with oh, it. Oh, sure. They're totally enamored with Completely it. Completely attracted to mm -hmm. water. <laughs> so then when we did the color blocking, we did yellow, and in about three days, this will be a vivid purple. Mm -hmm. You can and see them starting to And it'll be very come airy now. and bright, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what an English garden is, just sort of formal, but not. Talk about the boxwood a little bit. Clearly there is some maintenance required to keep the formal <laughs> shape of this garden. Yes, only thing we have to do here is basically just keep them trimmed as they grow. Um, boxwoods like to do the mounding thing, but we want mm -hmm. to keep it a hedge. A square. And mm -hmm. so as it grows, it'll all fill in. Great, looks terrific. Now you have done a beautiful job. The fountain is an example of incorporating structure, sculpture, art into your garden. Mm -hmm. We saw the fairy garden a little yeah. bit. Are, are you an artist also? I understand some of these pieces that you've actually made. I have made many of them, but I have not the painter. <laughs> I have wonderful friends that so are very good. artists, you build together. All right. right, right. You know, I'll find a craft and share it with them and they'll mm -hmm. take it to the next level and um, they just do a lovely job. I have a large leaf over there. It was one of the first ones I had ever done and graciously um, one of my garden friends had these elephant ears in her garden and I was enamored uh -huh. because it's a tropical mm -hmm. and I don't have enough shade to have that in my garden. Okay. So I use some of her leaves, and now I can have one in my garden. It's right. just paid. It's very permanent. Yes. And very mm -hmm. eye-catching, and it's enormous. Yes. It looks very really heavy. beautiful. They're heavy. Very heavy. Mm -hmm. Well, you have done a fabulous job with the space that you have. Thank you so much for letting us come well, and thank visit you, your Stephanie. garden. Thank you, Stephanie. You can come back anytime. Great. Have a mint julep under the pergola yes, with us. Yes, we'll do that. That All sounds right. terrific. Stay tuned. More Garden Connections is coming up next. On Garden Connections, we'd love to see photos of your garden. Or if you have questions for our garden experts, contact us by emailing garden at ksmq.org or like us on Facebook. I just love those Rochester garden tours. They're so beautiful. Well, we are in the studio and we're here with Audrey Alfson and she's telling us about the Houston Community Garden. Now, you talked about this being an educational objective mm -hmm. that you started with, and you guys came up with a model that's a little bit different than what you described most people are doing in terms of individual plots. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me what you guys do that's different. Um, initially, in the first four years, we're in our sixth year, we're finishing up the sixth year of the garden right now. Um, we, and we still maintain, but it's an open gate policy where we set up a garden. It's in a 100, 100 foot by 50 foot spot, totally fenced in. And it was run, it's been run entirely by volunteers. And all the harvest from all of the boxes, all of the land was going to the community. It would go to the food shelf, it goes to area seniors, okay. and any other people in the community who needed it. And it also benefited volunteers. So basically, if you come in, put some time in, you could benefit from this garden. Right. And that still, is, that still is the philosophy. We have an open gate. Uh, the, the mission, the, the, the words on the gate say, take what you need, give back what you can. And oh, so nice. th we keep an open gate policy for that mm -hmm. so that if somebody mm -hmm. wants some food, they can come and have some food. And people do. We and are can discovered. They come and learn about how to make it. They come and learn because the bigger part of it is well, there's so much to go, but we, we were able to partner with, or the Friends of the Houston Nature Center adopted us as a project because they're a 501c3 organization. Mm -hmm. So that enabled us to write grants. Okay. Um, and the very first grant we got was $300 from the Experiment in Rural Cooperation. And it may not seem like much, but it was enough to get us a fence. Because we had land, but if we didn't have a fence to put around it, we knew it wouldn't last <laughs> okay. because the deer and the rabbits would eat us out sure. of business. Right. So we knew we were in business from that time. And everything since then has been funded. The, the Cub Scouts have come in and helped build boxes. The 4-H Club got a grant and built a shed for us. We got another grant to bring in a water tank because we don't have water. Um, so the community has come forth really and all these different organizations nicely. have been part of this from the very That's beginning. Great. But the biggest thing that, we, that I'm really most proud of is the connection with the elementary school that we've maintained throughout those six years. 
-hmm. In the spring, we start seeds with second graders. Okay. And I'll go into the school and the school bought a stand and some grow lights so that we have a place in the school where they grow them. Mm -hmm. And we've purchased all the different starter equipment and things that go with that. But we'll go in and, in April, we start all the seeds and the second graders water and tend and love up these seeds. And then they Wonderful. come out to the garden in the end of May. Right. And they plant all their mm -hmm. seedlings, they plant any extra things that we direct sow into the ground. Mm -hmm. And then we grow it during right. the summer. You the volunteers come it. through and they water it and we tend it up and try and keep ahead of the weeds which is always a very always daunting a task. Yep. <laughs> For every but then in the fall, these same kids come back as third graders, third graders and they're following another curricular connection where they come back looking for ecosystem and habitat connections. Okay. So they come back with their little mi their little magnifying glasses and their diggers and they're digging through the empty boxes that we've, because we've cleaned things out and they're mm -hmm. loving to find the worms and they find the frogs and they find the toads right. and the bugs and the centipedes. You guys have also done a really great job engaging the children, but mm -hmm. also I've, I've seen some pictures of what goes on out there and you engage the entire spectrum of age range. Yeah. We, have, we have an incredible range of volunteers out there and, and we've had folks come out and bring their infants in car seats and they hang out and nap while they're weeding and harvesting up to folks who are in their 80s. We've had gentlemen in there in their 80s who love to come out and help water or even one that helps shift compost and dig post holes and wow. I mean it's That's it's great. it really is a huge connection and I know that from the nursing home the activities director will often bring people down to the garden to visit during the summers in the golf cart mm -hmm. and they can get around and walk around wherever they want right, as well those were really important values that I'm really glad we were able to set in place that have really come to pe to fruition because That's people great. enjoy yep. being able to garden. You guys started out with a nice vision, you kind of knew what you mm -hmm. wanted to accomplish, established some of those kind of basic core values. Yeah. Surely working with a diverse group of folks, you're going to run into some challenges. For folks, for communities that are saying, gosh, you know, we'd love to do something like this. It's about time, you know, we jumped mm -hmm. on this initiative too. What are some key sticky points that you would encourage people to consider as they're making plans for the community garden? You know, the, one th the biggest thing is that you've got to have a strong group of people who support it, um, especially the way we've run it. Um, up until a couple of years ago, we had no families in there. Two years ago, we opened up boxes for individual families, and so that helps. But it's still a lot of work administratively, especially the way that we're doing it with, mm -hmm. the, with the school connections and all these things and summer mm -hmm. class with the kids come in during the summer and things we run. Mm -hmm. Simple, straightforward community gardens are not going to be as, as much work, right, right. but um, you still need a real clear sense of who your volunteer base is to maintain it. Okay. Who's in charge of it? Do you have access to water? Um, how accessible is the garden in general? Mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure that you have safety things taken in mind, that if you're, that whose land you're on, do you have right. insurance to make sure that mm -hmm. you're covered? In, in the event of something happening, there's a lot of little things just to make sure that you have the resources right. that right. are going to ensure that people are going to have a successful experience in the garden, right. which and we've tried to do. And it will continue long term. Yeah. Great. Yeah. You guys have done a ton of work. We are going to take a break for just a minute and head out to Chef Stephen Larson at the Quarter Quarter Restaurant. He has prepared a delicious recipe for us, and when we come back, we'll get some final tips from Audrey. Hi, welcome to the kitchen. I'm going to make us some hush puppies. And a lot of people think that these are difficult to make, but they're actually really, really easy. Now, of course, I can't leave anything be and do just a classic cornmeal hush puppy. I have to throw some goodies in there, too. So in addition to our cornmeal, which I have here, and the flour, salt, sugar, baking powder, I'm also gonna add some crab and some red bell pepper and some green onion to that as well. So first things first, we always mix the dry ingredients to get those well blended. Then we add our wet ingredients, which will include a half a cup of milk, a couple of tablespoons of heavy cream, add a little richness, and one large egg. So we can mix that together and we'll get kind of a stiff paste out of that. And that's what we're looking for. This needs to hold together while it's cooking. Next can go in the crab and some finely diced red bell pepper. 
Now I also need some green onion in here. So to clean that, I'm going to cut the end off. I've washed this, of course, and we'll trim any wilted ends. Cut it in half, half again, and then thinly slice. So one green onion will end up giving you about two tablespoons of sliced. Okay, and that's what we're looking for there. And we can bring that back around and switch to a spatula here. And we will just fold that together. I think one of the things that concerns people most about making hush puppies or any deep fried food at home is the frying itself. So alleviating a fear of frying is what I'm trying to do here. And an easy way to do that is just to use an electric skillet as your fryer. You've got a great open area, lots of surface area. You've got a thermostat that you can set the temperature. And with this, we want to have the temperature at about 365 degrees. That's going to end up giving a very light, very fluffy, not heavy and greasy hush puppy because, of course, we want it light and fluffy. So I'm going to scoop that out. And we'll get those all going. All right, and there's our last one. Now we're going to let these cook for just a few minutes. They really only take about three or four minutes to finish cooking. And I'm going to serve these with uh, tartar sauce, but we're going to uh, really kind of bump up the flavor there by adding some hot green salsa, which is a jalapeno salsa, to our purchased tartar sauce. Use your favorite brand there and some fire roasted green chilies. Now these are very mild, but they add a terrific flavor to them. All right, so our hush puppies are ready to take out of the hot oil. Those are looking fantastic. G, B, and D as we like to say, golden brown and delicious. And I'm using what's called a spider here to take these out. This is a really handy thing you can get at restaurant rest supply places. Paper towel lined pan. We'll get those guys out of there, give them a good shake, and let them drain for a couple of minutes. And then to serve, if you want to do this individually, which you can certainly do for a dinner party, makes a very pretty presentation, take a little small container like that, put in the jalapeno tartar sauce, and then just place about six of those around the outside. So there we have it, crab hush puppies with jalapeno tartar sauce, a spiced up classic version of a country staple. Well, we're here in the studio, we're talking about the Houston Community Garden with Audrey Alfson. You guys have done fantastic work, and what I love about your garden is it has progressed and it has developed according to the needs of the community. And one of the things that you shared with me is now you're doing um, more than just growing. You're talking about preserving and baking and other things. Tell yeah. us about some of the other programming that's sprung up as a result of this. Well, and, and it's, it's sprung up from the beginning actually and it probably is rooted in the educational base, my background, my love of this, but also of the volunteers and the interest that from the beginning we have held um, all sorts of classes. Every summer we would do something at least once a month, whether it was what we call a foodie movie for a while, for okay. a couple summers we were showing 
get, going through the permission processes of showing um, different food movies, sure. Food Matters and Dirt, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Future of Food, a number of fresh. Mm -hmm. um, we've also done a number of different classes. One, square foot gardening, done classes on okay, square foot sure. gardening. We've done classes on dehydrating. We've done classes on organic foods, wine making. Um, sauerkraut making, seed saving. I mean, there's been, there's been many, many classes that we've offered over the course of the last five years. Okay. Uh, we've gone, the last year or so, we've done fewer classes and we've done more food celebrations because we wanted to focus more on even cooking things because that's what right. people want. Right, and that's something and you so mentioned early right. on is people were like, what do I do with this anyway? Yeah, so we've done uh, salsa making classes. We've done mm -hmm. the last two years a pesto festo, which has <laughs> been really, really fun where people yeah. bring in samples of pesto and you can come in and vote for your favorite and oh, we yeah, have favorite. awards for the besto of the pesto festo. Oh, that's fun. It's sounds fun. great and it sounds like you have a great group putting this together. We do. do you, you have a ton of experience. Do you have a website that people could turn to for information about kind of how you put this together? We do. One of my volunteers said, let me put together websites so we can share pictures and people can find us. I Great. said, fine. Give us the address. I believe it's www.houstongarden.webs.com, okay. I think it is. Sounds good. We'll so. put that up on the screen for folks in case they have questions and want to see how you have really engaged your community mm -hmm. in this community garden concept. Audrey, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed the show. We look forward to seeing you next time on Garden Connections. Thank you.